Every year on the fourth Thursday in November, Americans of diverse faiths, creeds, and cultural backgrounds get together to celebrate one of the nation's most beloved holidays, Thanksgiving. Most of us were taught the neat and tidy grade school narrative that Thanksgiving started when some pilgrims came together with their Native American neighbors to celebrate with a feast after having survived a brutal New England winter. And to some extent this is true, but it's far from the whole story. This is a Week in Doubt holiday special. Join me now for a brief history of Thanksgiving. Prior to the arrival of the Mayflower in 1620, there had already been Thanksgiving observances in the New World. In 1541, Spanish conquistador and explorer Francisco Vasquez de Coronado held a Thanksgiving celebration in the Palo Duro Canyon in present-day Texas after food and water had been found for his exhausted men. Then in 1619, settlers from Gloucester, England, held a Thanksgiving observance at what was then called Berkeley Hundred, later to be known as Berkeley Plantation, after safely arriving at the shore of Virginia. What we now think of as the first Thanksgiving wouldn't take place until the fall of 1621, when a group of pious religious separatists, the Pilgrims of Plymouth Colony, gave thanks for an abundant harvest and for having survived their first New England winter. The Mayflower, a rather typical English merchant ship, arrived in Plymouth Harbor on December 16, 1620. Aboard were a crew of about 30 and 102 passengers, English religious separatists who had been living in Holland. One of the reasons they had left was for fear they would suffer persecution once Holland's truce with Catholic Spain came to an end. Their first winter was exceptionally harsh. The cold, coupled with malnutrition and disease, nearly halved the group's numbers, sometimes killing off as many as two or three people a day, leaving only 52 survivors. When the Mayflower finally left for England, she was left with only half a crew. Despairing from loss and with no successful crops, the separatist community finally received what they took as a sign from God. A native man entered the village and introduced himself in English as Squanto. Squanto, or Tisquantum, was one of the last Pawtuxet, a Native American tribe who had become subordinate to the Wampanoag. Squanto would become an invaluable friend and asset. He taught the settlers how to plant native vegetables and served as an interpreter for their dealings with the Wampanoag and other tribes. By the fall, Plymouth Colony had a bumper crop including squash, pumpkins, and native corn. Governor William Bradford declared a festival to celebrate the abundant harvest. The religiously austere separatists shunned holidays such as Christmas and Easter, which they viewed as being pagan and frivolous, but they still observed an old English holiday known as Harvest Home. Farming was a central part of life in medieval and early modern Europe. Harvest Home was a time to give thanks for nature's bounty. Similar to medieval Christmas, it was a bit of a hybrid holiday. There were both secular and religious aspects to it. On the one hand, sheaths of grain were brought to church, and people gave thanks to God. But on the other hand, there was also singing, dancing, feasting, and merriment. The story goes that the pilgrims invited some local Indian allies, including Massasoit, the Sackham or leader of the Wampanoag Confederacy, to their harvest celebration. A competing theory or account is that Massasoit and 90 of his men came in response to the thunderous sounds of pilgrim men firing cannon and muskets, possibly as a show of force. Either way, the meeting proved peaceful. Edward Winslow, a senior leader of the separatists, wrote the following. Our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling, that so we might after a special manner rejoice together, after we had gathered the fruits of our labors. They four in one day killed as much fowl as with a little help beside, served the company almost a week, at which time amongst other recreations we exercised our arms, many of the Indians coming amongst us and amongst the rest of their greatest king Massasoit with some ninety men, whom for three days we entertained and feasted, and they went out and killed five deer, which they brought to the plantation and bestowed on our governor, and upon the captain and others. And although it be not always so plentiful as it was at this time with us, yet by the goodness of God we are so far from want that we often wish you partakers of our plenty. The feast had been prepared by the five surviving pilgrim women, 
Edward Winslow's writings don't mention exactly what kind of fowl the four hunters dispatched by Governor Bradley returned with, but given that the turkey, a bird native to the New World, was a food source for both the settlers and the natives, it seems to be plausible that it was featured at the 1621 Harvest Feast. But it's also possible that there was also duck, goose, and possibly even swan. Seafood, including cod and bass, and possibly even lobster, may have been on the menu as well. Local vegetables, which were a part of the pilgrims' bountiful harvest, such as Indian corn, as well as indigenous fruit, were probably also eaten. Since the community was without ovens at the time, there would be no pies. A shortage of sugar probably means there was another missing Thanksgiving staple, cranberry sauce. The pilgrims eschewed the use of forks. They would have gotten by with the use of knives, spoons, and their fingers. We've come to think of this harvest feast as the first Thanksgiving, but to the separatists and Puritans, days of Thanksgiving were austere religious occasions, marked by fasting and contemplation. What the pilgrims would have considered the first Thanksgiving transpired two years later in 1623, after prayers for rain were answered. The rain saved the pilgrims' faltering crops, and a solemn day of prayer and thanks to Providence was observed. There would have been no feasting. At the most, the day would have ended with a small meal. 17th century America quickly became a land of plenty, and all those solemn days of thanksgiving were still declared throughout the year. A New England tradition developed of colonial governors declaring a general day of thanksgiving every fall. New Englanders were already in the habit of attending church on Thursdays for a weekly sermon, so governors often chose the day for a fall thanksgiving. The exact calendar date was never known, so people waited for the governor to make his proclamation and then began their baking and preparations. Some foods like mince pie and plum pudding were traditionally associated with Old English Christmas, but since the Puritans didn't celebrate Christmas, they were featured at fall Thanksgiving instead. It didn't take long for food to start eclipsing prayer as the central focus of Thanksgiving. Before the close of the 17th century, ministers were already complaining about the lack of religious meaning and observance. Each colonial governor had proclaimed Thanksgiving days at their own discretion, but in 1777, General George Washington proclaimed a day of Thanksgiving for all the colonies in honor of the victory at Saratoga. When the 13 colonies became the United States following the American Revolution, Thanksgiving began to become more widespread, but still not all the states celebrated the holiday. In 1779, Boston schoolgirl Juliana Smith wrote the following to her cousin Betsy. Then there were six of the Livingston family next door. They had never seen a Thanksgiving dinner before, having been used to keep Christmas Day instead, as is the want in New York province. With the 19th century belief in manifest destiny, many New Englanders started to move out west, bringing the tradition of Thanksgiving with them. On December 26, 1850, the territory of Minnesota celebrated Thanksgiving for the first time. Alexander Ramsey, the governor of the territory, offered the following Thanksgiving proclamation. Young in years as a community, we have come into the wilderness, in the midst of savage men and uncultivated nature, to found a new empire in aid of our pursuit of happiness, and to extend the area of enlightened republican liberty. Let us in the public temple of religion, by the fireside and family altar, on the prairie and in the forest, join in the expression of our gratitude, of our devotion to the God who brought our fathers safely through the perils of an early revolution, and who thus continues his favors to the remotest colonies of his sons. Despite the pious nature of Governor Ramsey's proclamation, the celebration was by all accounts quite spirited. The settlers feasted on frontier fare like buffalo, bear, and venison, and partied into the night. Another unorthodox Thanksgiving took place in 1849, when Christian missionaries in Hawaii threw a Thanksgiving feast for King Kamehameha in the form of a traditional luau. Every fall, young New Englanders who had moved away would return home for Thanksgiving, perhaps setting a precedent for the Thanksgiving journey home that so many of us embark on to this day. 1800s New England was still predominantly farm country. Thanksgiving, like the Feast of 1621, was a celebration of abundance. New England housewives would prepare meals that would make modern Thanksgiving dinners pale in comparison. There was turkey and also other fowls such as roast duck and roast goose, sometimes even leg of lamb, and for dessert a variety of pies and plum pudding. 
By the middle of the 19th century, most of America celebrated Thanksgiving. Local elected officials still practiced the tradition of declaring a specific date each year. Sometimes the date from year to year or state to state could vary by weeks or even months. A young New England widow named Sarah Josepha Hale made campaigning for one national date for Thanksgiving her life's work. Sarah was a writer and a poet, and she eventually came to work as an editor for Godey's Ladies Book, the most widely circulated magazine of the 19th century. Godey's Ladies Book covered an eclectic array of topics, everything from recipes and sewing tips to politics and architecture. Every fall, Sarah Josepha Hale would offer tips on how to throw a traditional New England Thanksgiving. With the push for abolition and ultimately the Civil War, mid-19th century America was bitterly divided between North and South. Sarah Josepha Hale hoped that a national day of Thanksgiving would help unify a fractured nation. Every year, she would write Northern and Southern governors pleading for a single date for Thanksgiving, specifically the last Thursday in November. Southern governors scoffed and viewed this push for Thanksgiving as an attempt by Yankees to impose their values on the South. In 1863, four months after the victory at Gettysburg, seeing like Sarah Josepha Hale the unifying potential of the gesture, President Abraham Lincoln declared a National Day of Thanksgiving for the last Thursday in November. The governor of Texas refused to declare Thanksgiving, referring to it as a damned Yankee institution, but for the most part the tradition swept the rest of the country. The Victorian nouveau riche tried to adopt the pretense of wealth. There were menu cards written in French and mismatching china and chairs, but soon mass production would make luxuries like matching dinnerware cheap and readily available. The Indian Wars continued throughout the 19th century, and the work of Victorian artists reflected the ongoing tension. The quote-unquote first Thanksgiving or Harvest Feast of 1621 was depicted as more of a standoff than a friendly gathering. When the Indian Wars finally came to an end, the depictions of interactions between the pilgrims and their native neighbors became more peaceful and irenic. The tradition of practicing acts of charity at Thanksgiving time goes all the way back to the colonial period, when gifts of turkey and firewood were given to the poor. This continued well into the Victorian era, when society women would invite unfortunates and poor children to five-course meals. The modern tradition of watching football on Thanksgiving can be traced back to the early 20th century. At the time, a six-day work week was the norm. Thanksgiving gave people a chance to enjoy some leisure time. A pastime of choice was rooting for the home team. In the 1920s, pro teams started popping up all over the country, and a new team called the Detroit Lions, in an attempt to garner attention, advertised a free Thanksgiving Day game. In New York, there was the yearly tradition of the ragamuffin parade. Young men donned outlandish costumes and paraded through the streets. Thanksgiving parades began to pop up across the map, and many were co-opted by department stores. The most famous example being the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, which first began in 1924. There were complaints from the clergy that the parades were drawing more people than church. Although Thanksgiving Day parades were used by department stores to kick off the Christmas shopping season, unlike Christmas with its lavish gift-giving, Thanksgiving itself as a holiday has proven fairly resistant to commercialism. In 1939, in an attempt to stimulate an economy devastated by the Great Depression, by increasing the length of the Christmas shopping season, FDR moved Thanksgiving up a week. Many were offended by the president's tinkering with tradition. Democratic states fell in line, but Republican states refused to move the date. In 1941, Congress permanently moved Thanksgiving back to the last Thursday in November. A tradition stemming back to the 1940s is the National Thanksgiving Turkey Presentation, where the President of the United States is presented with a turkey, often of the broad-breasted white variety. Domestic turkeys were bred to be white because it makes for a cleaner-looking dress bird. It wasn't until the administration of George H.W. Bush that the pardoning of the turkey presented became a fixed part of the tradition. There is a common misconception that Benjamin Franklin wanted the turkey to be the national bird instead of the bald eagle. But it wasn't until two years after the design of the Great Seal was approved and finalized that Franklin mentioned his thoughts on the two birds in a letter to his daughter. 
The letter was mainly regarding the Society of Cincinnati, a military order or fraternity made up of revolutionary officers. One of the aspects of the order that Franklin was critical of was the design of their badge. In typical comedic fashion, he joked that some thought the eagle on the badge looked more like a dindun or a turkey. He wrote the following regarding the bald eagle and the turkey. For my own part, I wish the bald eagle had not been chosen as the representative of our country. He is a bird of bad moral character. He does not get his living honestly. You may have seen him perched on some dead tree near a river, where, too lazy to fish for himself, he watches the labor of the fishing hawk. And when that diligent bird has at length taken a fish and is bearing it to his nest for the support of his mate and young ones, the bald eagle pursues him and takes it from him. I am on this account not displeased that the figure is not known as a bald eagle, but looks more like a turkey, for in truth the turkey is in comparison a much more respectable bird, and withal a true original native of America. Eagles have been found in all countries, but the turkey was peculiar to ours, the first of the species seen in Europe being brought to France by the Jesuits from Canada and served up at the wedding table of Charles the Ninth. He is besides, though, a little vain and silly, a bird of courage, and would not hesitate to attack a grenadier of the British guards, who should presume to invade his farmyard with a red coat on. Another misconception regarding the turkey is that the tryptophan it contains is the reason we get sleepy on Thanksgiving. In reality, turkey, relatively speaking, contains no more tryptophan than other poultry. In fact, it contains less of the amino acid than chicken. It's most likely a combination of overeating, especially binging on carbohydrates, alcohol consumption, and the toll of all the excitement of the day that makes us feel ready for a nap after Thanksgiving dinner. Well, from the landing of some religious separatists on the shore of the New World to the Macy's Day Parade and presidential turkey pardons, I hope you enjoyed this Weekend Out holiday special. This has been a brief history of Thanksgiving. Thanks for listening.